It is Locked on Jazz for the 28th of November, a weekend against the West's best, and the heart still shows. The Jazz have the number two offense in the entire NBA, and it blows my mind. We're not real good, or really good, at transition defense or defensive rebounding. We're talking about all of it, plus late game watches. It's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. Bum 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 pow. You are locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. This is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all podcasting apps, wherever app you're getting this on, or on YouTube. Please hit the follow or subscribe button. Five stars is greatly appreciated. If you're on YouTube, hit the little bell, Liberty Bell button, so that we you can get notified anytime we're live. Um, and our poll, our question today on YouTube chat, favorite part of the weekend. Was it Nikhil Alexander Walker's play? Was it the overall improvement or was it just the heart of this basketball team? And that's what jumped out to me the most again this weekend. And today's episode is brought to you by prize picks. First time users can receive a hundred percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars. The promo code locked on that's prizepicks.com. promo code locked on. You know, Will already got asked, and we're and this is becoming somewhat of a regular theme. We we go into these towns, and you know, we're the story of like this surprise team, and what about us? And so Will Hardy gets asked, you know, oh, what surprised you? What have you learned about your team? And his answer the other night to Janie McCauley of the uh, AP in the Bay Area was that we have heart, and that really does sum up the first twenty some odd games of the season to me for, about the Utah Jazz. Is this team does. It just has heart. Like, it plays hard. It gets after it. It battles every night. Right now, they've lost four in a row, and they've lost seven of nine. But there's a level of of energy and tenacity and effort on a night-in and night-out basis on what has been a pretty brutal schedule. I know you that always kind of falls on deaf ears, but there like are some just simple facts. Like, the Jazz have played 14 road games. I don't think there's anyone else in the NBA that has played 14 road games. Um, Detroit has played 13. The Brooklyn Nets in the East have played 12. Denver has played 13. To their credit, they're 8-5 and five on those games and probably worth taking note of that they have done that. They've only played six home games and they've played 13 road games and they're one game out of first place that's in the West. It's probably worth making sure that you're everyone's aware of that. Um, you know, we've played 22 games. Uh, if you look around, you see that the Spurs have played 21 and the Warriors have played 21 and no one else in the league has played 22. So there are some aspects where there's been a wear down factor where I think there could have been plenty of nights where to not have heart, like where, you know, you're being taxed and everyone's being pushed and it isn't a team with a Joel Embiid or even a Donovan Mitchell or a Bradley Beal or a go-to guy that carries the load. It's a collective effort on a nightly basis and, there seems like there was a lot of opportunities for guys to wear down. We just haven't seen that. It's really been pretty awesome. Um, and I think that's, that still is kind of the number one telling thing to me that jumps out the most about this team is, is exactly that. Like the level of heart that they've played in in every single one of these games to me is pretty awesome. Now over the weekend they lose twice. The Warriors have clicked in. The Warriors' first quarter against us was, was pretty vintage Golden State. That was... That was pretty awesome. And then they did it for a half last night uh, or midday yesterday against the Timberwolves. If you got a chance to watch it, I don't suspect you did. You probably had either football, World Cup, or other things to do. Um, maybe go to church. Uh, they Warriors were great. Uh, so we ran into to a team that I think has clicked in. They're 9-1 and one, or now 10-1 and one at home, one of those two. And they were brilliant in that game. Their first quarter the other night, they just ran by us, but with – the ball just never stops. It just never stops. They were 16 of 28 in the first. Um, they had 12 assists on their 16 baskets. It was awesome, actually. If I was to introduce the NBA to someone, the first place I would go is to have them watch Steph Curry. Like, if I if I 
had somebody who was becoming an NBA fan, didn't know the game. I'd love to just sit down with them and watch the bat, watch Steph Curry play and watch the Warriors move the ball. It's so elegant and gorgeous. And, you know, there was a, we, we, we got waxed pretty good. We were down 14 at the end of one and worked our way back. Like, I think that's, you know, and I thought, I, I'm not sure always what I think about this in a lot of circumstances. Um, in the sense of like, I think Will said, hey, we won three of the four quarters. I'm, you know, okay, I kind of, but on that sense, like, I get it. Like, I think I understand what he's saying. Like, from the second quarter on, it was 95, 92 Jazz. Like, that's the, the world champs right there, playing at full throttle and playing really, really well. And hitting 16 of 33 from three from the second quarter on, it wasn't like they went cold and the Jazz still battled, actually outscored them by two in that stretch. I thought the Jazz, and without, without Mike Conley, and then, you know, you go to Phoenix the next night, and I would say, in kind of same theme on this, I thought the Jazz were really, really good. It was another great game. Phoenix is good. They're playing without Cam Johnson and without Chris Paul, and they're still really, really good. Um, our guys, you know, Lowry has had some nights here where fatigue looks like it gets him. That was one of them. And yet then Jordan turns around as 22. Colin has his best game of the year with 20. We play our best game without Mike Conley by a mile. Um, and we look way better than we have in, in any of the other games without Mike Conley. Uh, we defend Devin Booker quite well, 27 points, 27 shots. We just don't can't handle a former number one pick in DeAndre Ayton, who's really good. The thing is, like, the, it's interesting. I did Locked on NBA today with Jackson Gatlin, and you can listen to it, and, and it's like, oh, they started the tank. No, Mike Conley got hurt. Like, Mike, we were winning close, close games – Night in and night out, down to the wire. Mike Conley making incredible plays. This is a 35-year-old point guard who's in control. Organizing, setting things up. We were limiting our mistakes. And now Mike Conley got hurt. And there's just little plays every single night that are the difference between winning and losing. And I'm not, like, I'm not, I don't want to pick on anyone, but I'll just give a few examples. There's a fast break late in the game the other night. And Colin Sexton is bringing the ball, is, is, bringing it up, and Beasley is open across the court in transition for three. And Sexton just holds the ball for three or four steps too many. If he throws the pass to where Beasley is going to be, then Beasley probably catches it in motion. I think this is with, it's a, if I remember correctly, it's like 113, 110. There are 53 seconds left. Payne's missed. We're in transition. Like, this is a three to tie. And Sexton brings it up the far side. And Beasley is going to be open. Beasley's got his hands up. If he throws to where Beasley is going to be, you know, throwing to get the receiver open, Beasley catches, has a wide open three, and a chance for a tie game. Instead, Colin takes in an extra dribble, takes it in an extra step too far. It's just not a natural point guard. This is not a criticism. This is just how it played out. Beasley actually gets to the three-point line, sets his feet, still has his hands in the air. Then the pass is thrown. And by this time, DeAndre Ayton is sprinting down the floor, and Ayton gets a steal with 53.3 seconds left on what could have been a Beasley three to win it, like or to tie it. The, that's, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, Colin Sexton didn't have the ball in his hands and, it's, you know, you can butterfly effect this to the end of the earth. But that's an example to me if we're just making one or two little mistakes each night without Mike Conley that makes a difference. And, you know, who's to say that Mike Conley had the ball in that circumstance and transition off that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can prove that, but it does feel like that's the way it's been. The same thing I would say on Saturday, there's a play in which um, – Jordan Clarkson brings the ball. It's in transition. Clarkson brings it up. Three on two break. Beasley flares to the right wing. He's wide open for three. I think we're down like six at the point. Where this is going to bring us to three. Clarkson instead stops for a pull up off the bounce three straight away. It's, you know, hey, I love Jordan. Um, I love everything about the way he's played this year. That's not the greatest shot for him. And it's certainly not as good as the best three-point shooter kind of in the NBA or one of the best three-point shooters in the NBA, wide open on the right side of Malik Beasley. So Colin pulls for three. Excuse me, Clarkson pulls for three and misses. And uh, they take it back the other way and Clay Thompson hits the three. 
And, you know, those are just the little plays that are swinging games. There was a subtle, subtle one in the late in the Phoenix game where Will Hardy puts Clarkson at the helm at the point guard and he's trying to run a flare to the left wing. Might have been to Beasley again. Um, I'd have a hard time finding this one. And it's a set play. And Clarkson just drifts a little bit too far to his right in the set play. It's a misdirection. They run a bunch of action on the right side. And then coming on a, on a backside pin down is Beasley for three is my memory. And, sex, and, and the fake action happens on the right. And Clarkson just gets kind of caught one or two steps. Such a minor little amount over to the right-hand side further than he should so that when he then chests the pass to Beasley, it's in the air long enough that Mikel Bridges taps it and knocks it out of bounds. Luckily, Mikel Bridges doesn't take it the other way for a dunk. Now, we didn't lose the ball. We didn't turn it over. But, like the play, like Bridges is shooting that gap. That pass gets to Beasley. He is wide open for three. And those are the plays we're just missing right now. We're just And, again, I'm not... Like, this is just reality. One, one guy is a veteran point guard has been in the league for 15 years, one of the better natural point guards, and every other guy we're asking to do this right now has not done it with any regularity. So I think I think there's a, you know, this is just the reality of like, well, oh my gosh, you've lost four in a row. Yeah, not surprised in any way, shape, or form that this team without Mike Conley, who I've called multiple times the thread that holds the fabric together, is losing games, and it's these little tiny plays in a league where the margins super thin. Our, our differential is plus one, you know, plus one or two. A night. Like, if you don't think Mike Conley gives us a point or two a night with the way he plays, you're crazy. It's really that simple. Um, I do want to talk about the fact that the offense is the number two offense in all of the NBA. This is mind-blowing to me. Completely mind-blowing. We're going to dig into that in a second. It's it's really incredible. Uh, it's a statement to what Will Hardy's doing. It's a statement to who these guys are. It's it's uh, furthest thing I could have ever imagined on this basketball team is that it would be the number two offense in the NBA. So we'll continue. And we'll talk about that. It's a Monday edition. It is brought to you by our friends over at Murdoch Chevy, located in Woods Cross, also up in Logan. The Chevy lineup of trucks and cars is truly remarkable and awesome. Uh, the trucks in this time of year often is a good time to go get a truck for the company or things like that. I think there's something called taxes. Um, but it is the season of giving as well. $5,000 off the Silverado right now. The Silverado 2.7 half ton 1500 that's the big Mac daddy truck of them all. The powerhouse that is the Silverado. The Colorado is the smaller, zippier truck over there. They've got over 100 in stock right now, so some of the stocking issues have gone by the wayside. The SUVs, you know the legendary Tahoe and the Suburban, but the Trailblazer, Blazer, Traverse, Equinox, and Trax are all outstanding as well. If you're looking for an electric car, the Bolt is open to eyes from people. It's all at Murdoch Chevy, located in Woods Cross, also in Logan. If you're going to stop by, please Email me first. We'll set you up with a VIP meeting with the Murdochs over at Murdoch Chevy. Today's show is also brought to you by Turo. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want, wherever you want it. From a community of local hosts, browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Book a spacious SUV or a minivan for a family road trip. Get a classic or a luxury car for a special event, birthday, or holiday. Find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget. It's all there for you. Test drive the new electric vehicle and see what it's like if you want to. Many tour hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms and conditions exclusions to apply. Forget boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. T-U-R-O.com. That's T-U-R-O. Dot com, Turo dot com. Thanks so much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. For your second listen, it's the 22-minute rundown of all things on a major weekend of sports. Go get it at Locked On Sports today with host Peter Bukowski, who's on the Jordan Love campaign right now. He's also our Packers host. All right, so the Jazz offense is the number two offense in the NBA. I, I, I'm, I gotta be honest, this is like... Of things that have, are out there that have blown my mind the most, this is it. So let's go through. There's three different metrics that people use to, to judge this. It's offensive rating, in which case the Jazz offensive rating is the fourth biggest, best offense behind Boston, Sacramento, Phoenix, and Utah. That's overall. But the minute you take out blowout minutes of any games, 
Then you get to cleaning the glasses metric system. So you, just so you know why I'm saying what I'm doing, which is what I use because I think that's the most effective way to look at it. And then the Jazz are the number two offense, pretty far behind Boston, who's blowing up historical records. And it's Boston, Utah, Phoenix, and Denver. Sacramento's actually really profited off blowout minutes. They're down to six. And then there's Tyler Snars, um, site dunks and threes, which is set to evaluate your strength of opponents and things of that nature, which I really like. And you look at that, and that has our offense at second. So the two systems that I actually like the most, cleaning the glass and Taylor Schnarr's system, both of which I think, you know, judge correctly for various different reasons. One, based on who you've played, and two, based on um, non-blowout minutes. The Jazz are the second best offense in the NBA. This is incredible. So first question is why? Well, that's that's a great that's a great place to start. So if we look at the four factors, they're the sixth best shooting team in the league, which I just never saw coming. Like if you kind of go back and look at it, and when I did the um, points gained analysis of the Jazz offense, I had us 13th in the West or 12th in the West. Jordan Clarkson's supposed to be an inefficient player. Taylor Horton Tucker's an inefficient player. Nikhil Alexander Walker's a terribly inefficient player. Um, Larry Markin's never been particularly finished. Kelly Olynyk's not been this before. Markin and Olynyk are like crazy efficient, top level efficiency players right now in what they're doing. Um, it's it's really like stunning. It's also a tribute to actually if as we kind of I think it's actually interesting how fast this kind of went by the wayside. But this idea of whether, you know, wondering who Will Hardy is as a head coach really disappeared super quickly into this process, which is great. Um, but it's a tribute to what he's built and and where he what he's done with his offense, that he's getting this much out of each of the guys. So we're the sixth best shooting team. We're 23rd in the league in turnovers. We're the fourth best team in the league at offensive rebounding. We're 25th in the league in free throw shooting. So we're getting the fourth in offensive rebounding is vital to our offensive success. It's... It's taking us from the sixth best shooting team and propelling us with these extra possessions to the second best overall offensive rating. Um, and so that's that's pretty that's a large part of what's taking place here. Now, the other thing is just guys are having really good years. And that's the other part that I think is kind of crazy is is worth, you know, jumping out at um, and highlighting is some of our guys that are having these these really fabulous years for um, for the Jazz so far. So um, if you look, Lowry Markinen obviously is the is the highlight of this. Um, estimated plus minus, he's a plus 3.7. His, he's in the 94th percentile offensively right now in the way he's playing. Kelly Olenek is doing the same thing. Um, you've got Jordan Clarkson who's had this like incredible year where he's chameleoned into doing you know multiple playing in a different way than he's ever played before and is just dramatically more efficient than he was. He's his estimated plus minus using Taylor Schnarr's system. He's taken him from a 1.2 to a 2.9. So he's doubled his value um, in what he's doing offensively right now. His true shooting percentage is from 54 to 56%. He's just gotten so he's just so much more efficient for marketing. You're upped his load dramatically and you've taken his true shooting percentage and his effective field goal percentage, his true shooting percentage from 58 to 64%, from the 67th percentile to the 84th percentile. I mean, that is that is a huge jump. This is a tribute to the system and the way they're all playing together. Kelly Olenek's another one who, you know, has been a little oft injured, but he's his true shooting percentage. True shooting percentage, by the way, is your shooting plus any free throw shooting you're doing, which we're not doing a lot of, so I could talk effective field goal percentage. Kelly Linux having an out of body experience. His effective field goal percentage, which weighs three point shooting, is sixty five percent right now. He's in the ninety third percentile for the last, his his usual number in his career. He's kind of very consistently been fifty eight percent. So he's jumped from fifty eight to sixty five. Just remarkable. Jared Vanderbilt, who has never been a particularly good offensive player or rim finisher, um, particularly, is up just ever so slightly from fifty nine to sixty. So all these guys have just upticked it. Beasley's gone from an effective field goal percentage around 55, 53, where he usually is back to his career best 58 that he had in Denver. Um, really just impressive across the board. And when every single player on the team, Colin Sexton's actually right about where he kind of always is. His true shooting percentage and his effective field goal percentage are right where you expect to be. And the only guy who's dropped is Mike. 
for, for all the praise we give Mike, he actually hasn't shot it well, but he just has held the team together. But you look at our core guys and everything that they're they're primarily doing, you've got just a bunch of guys that have taken jumps, and then you add some offensive rebounding in there. And it's it but it's stunning to me. It didn't this is not something that I ever saw out of this group. Um, that they would be, you know, able to take this kind of a jump and and make this kind of step. So I think when you see it collectively like this, the takeaway I would have is it's system based. And this is a, a tribute to what Will Hardy's been able to put together, how they've been able to distribute their shots correctly, taking a lot of threes, getting to the rim a decent amount, um, and and playing the game in a manner that is the right, really in a right way to play. Their offensive shot distribution is really good. They they have the sixth best shooting team as we mentioned. They take the six most amount of threes they take the 16th most amount of rim shots um and then nothing crazy is actually going on anymore for a while we were shooting at the rim really well we're 15th best shooting team at the rim 10th best three-point shooting team um it's, it's it's super impressive it the margin um actually is fairly decent the jazz you know from two to seven is is a pretty decent margin there i think they're gonna stay top five for for an extended period of time um with this it's some you know Heart, heart and offense kind of jump out. All right, let's get to the frailties of the weekend. Um, transition defense and defensive rebounding were both problematic this weekend. So let's talk about both those things, kind of discuss them. And then uh, Ron Boat and I have been watching the end of close games every day on the plane, and we've spent a lot of time on the plane. I think you might actually miss me coming up here because um, we've spent so much time together, and then I'm not going to be there to, to do this for him. Uh, to download games and watch with him. So I've got a bunch of really quick thoughts about players, um, not as much kind of some of the offensive set stuff I've done in the past around the league. But we'll talk about the transition defense and defensive rebounding issues that have kind of captured the Jazz here um, for a second. Today's show is brought to you in part by our friends over at Prize Picks. I wonder why this is not working. There's supposed to be a little graphic that has po- popped up here and it is not popping up. Uh, I can see the graphic. Uh, I don't know why it's not showing up. <laughs> well, it's not showing up. So you'll just have to trust me about what the graphic says. And what the graphic says about prize picks is that the graphic says that the there it is, that you get 100% deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you're listening and not on YouTube right now, you really have no idea what's going on. It's called me putting an overlay on and it falling off. This is really inside baseball talk, and it's really not what you need to hear. Um, so... Here's how prize picks works. It's two, you pick two to six players. You choose whether they're going to score more or less or, or whatever you want, and you can win up 25% of your money on any entry. No competing against other people. It's just you versus projections. Prize picks offers projections on any sport. You name it, it's out there, like disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, yeah, and then all the majors. Enters, entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's easy, safe, and fast, easy withdrawals. Currently operational in 30 states and Canada. So download the prize picks app. Go to prizepicks.com, sign up, and daily fantasy sports. First-time users receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. All right, let's see if you can get this right. It's a test. What is a 100% instant deposit match up to $100? If you put in $72.50, what do you get back? Yes, $72.50. If you put in $25, what do you get back? $25. If you put in $100, what do you get back? $100, as long as you use the promo code locked on. If you put in $150, what do you get? 100 because it's up to 100. So don't forget to enter the promo code locked on to sign up for your instant deposit match up to $100 at prizepicks.com. Go download the app, use the promo code locked on, and you are all set. All right. The Utah Jazz, two frailties right now that are significant are transition defense and defensive rebounding. Let's start with transition defense. There's a few reasons for what's going on. One is cross matches. So because of the fact you're switching everything, everyone switches everything, and you're, we're moving the ball, we're playing five out, uh, you're ending up with guys guarding, being guarded by guys they're not supposed to guard, and then when they run back, they're trying to find the guy they guard instead of the, the right guy, and they get confused. There's a play in the Phoenix Suns game, a pretty big play late in the fourth quarter, in which... They get a fast break layup, and Ron Boone and I ran through it on the plane on the way back like three or four times. It's pretty hard to tell. Like, two guys went to the ball. 
in transition. Like, it kind of sucks, but that's what happened. Two guys in transition trying to get back defensively went to the ball, and it led to, an, I think, an Isaiah Wainwright kick out three with like, which was kind of like one of the biggest plays of the game. But it's a fast break. Devin Booker's in the middle of the floor. Uh, Beasley's all the way back. Wayne Wainwright's the only guy back. Booker's in the middle of the floor on the near side. I think his bridges and Lowry marking it. And I think it was Malik Beasley in pink shoes. No, that's not because Malik's back. So whoever's wearing pink shoes, um, are oh Nikhil Alexander Walker both go to Devin Booker, which means that on the left wing Saban Lee is wide open, which means Beasley then the one guy back has to cut off Saban Lee. Jared Vanderbilt does kind of run into no man's land and Taylor Horton Tucker helps to cut off and Jared Vanderbilt really does get quite confused and ends up guarding space, back backpedaling into space, thinking that there's someone somewhere and there's no one there and allows the pass to the corner, which isn't great. And Wainwright hits this monster three. And like Ron and I ran this back multiple times and Vanderbilt's running on the outside and Horton Tucker's kind of one slot in and Markin is there. And the true, yes, the Jazz need to bump. Every guy needs to bump one spot to the right. And so Alexander Walker probably needs to let Booker go to be able to go out to get to Saban Lee and Mark and he needs to cover Booker. Uh, to me, in real time, that looks really hard to do. Uh, maybe if maybe if Will Hardy, you know, maybe I'll ask Will Hardy about it tonight and maybe he'll tell me that that's a really natural basketball play that everybody should be able to make. But to me, when I watch that, like, that's hard. They're coming at you full speed ahead. You know, we've had plenty where we don't stop the ball. And so... There's a few things here. One, we're not particularly fast, right? Kelly Olenek, Lowry, Markinen, our bigs are not particularly fast. So we're, we're, we're having a hard time, I think, there. Ron Boone's talked about that a lot. Number two is, I think, this cross-matching matchup trying to figure out transition defense. Number three is we do have a tendency to not balance the floor correctly. In other words, Malik Beasley puts up a shot and Colin Sexton or Jordan Clarkson or someone's supposed to get back defensively when that shot goes up and they're crashing. We are doing that. That's got to, we got to watch that a little bit. So those are the three things on transition defense. Do I think this one's solvable? I think we can get, I think we'll get better at it because I think you've got a lot of teaching and developing going on with the coaching staff. Um, my concern on this really is actually just the amount of transition that other teams are in against us. In other words, they're just kind of have set their mind to it that we're not particularly quick and you can run on us, and then that gets them in the mindset. But right now, we're allowing 16.6% of possessions to be in transition. Um, if you look at it since, you know, I was looking at it since November 1st um, to try to see whether or not there was some trend, and I'll, I'll show you the two trends I tried to pull to see, like, is our team's running more on us recently. Um, so... The number since November 1st is 17.1%, which is the highest of any team in the NBA. We're last in the league at denying transition since November 1st. Uh, so that's not great. So then I went to kind of November 13th and said, okay, in the last two weeks, whether or not there's some level that we've gotten any better at that. And then we we're back to 26. Um, and teams are running on Orlando and Philadelphia and the Lakers more than us. So, I'm a little concerned that like the word is out to run on the Jazz, and then once the word's out, you actually can't slow it down. The second one is defensive rebounding. And I and, and our defensive rebounding is poor. I think we're 30th in the NBA now. I watched every single one of those off defensive rebounds late in the game against Phoenix. Um, Brooklyn, I guess, is worse than us. We're 29th. You know what? DeAndre Ayton's the number one pick who's bigger, stronger, taller, more athletic, and a better rebounder than our guys. Like, he's the number one pick. Like, it wasn't a lack of effort. Like, we got heart. That's still true. Lowry Markin and Kelly Olenek are there. You know what? Lowry Markin and Kelly Olenek are not particularly good defensive rebounders. Like, if you go look in Lowry Markin and, and if you go to B-Ball Index or you or you run to their basketball reference page and, and look up their notes, like, you look up Lowry Markin and the, the number, if you kind of understand how to look at advanced metrics, the number that jumps out is he's he's not a particularly good defensive rebounder. He's doing a, he's at twenty percent this year, which is far better than he's been in any year since his second year in the league. Like that's just not his. He's not a great defensive rebounder. Kelly and he had his body on Aiton on a bunch of these plays, and he couldn't get off his body to get the rebound. And so then DeAndre Aiton gets the rebound. Kelly Olynyk is not 
a vertical player. Uh, he's battling in there. He's big, but Kelly Olynyk is, you know, other than maybe one or two stretches in Miami, he's never been more than about a 20% defensive rebounder, and he's really low this year. At 31, that might be an area where he's slipping a little bit. He does not have a big reach. He's got a great body at 6'11", 240. He's big, but he's just got size. When someone's bigger and stronger going over him, like, and so you're, you know, your next rebounders are Jared Vanderbilt and Walker Kessler. Well, they are both really offensively limited right now. Like, Jared's doing a great job, but he is super offensively limited in what he's able to do as a rookie, not a, just a fact. Um, and so you just can't quite play him in closing minutes yet. He's also not a great free throw shooter. Um, Jared Vanderbilt's, you know, our best defensive rebounder at 26%, but he's really limited offensively. The three-point shooting, um, which was kind of fun early in the season, has dissipated. I don't think he's made one since November 12th. Um, he's missed, I think, about six in a row which is what I would expect. He's not been, you know, the fact that he started at 50%, 5 of 10 was cool, but it's not a sustainable model and teams don't guard him. So it's hard to close with him, but we might have to because he can defensive rebound. So this this is another one that honestly, I, I don't know that I see a lot of solutions. I think there's more solutions on transition defense than there are there. All right, quick notes running around the league. Um, this is going to be really rapid fire quick. And as I mentioned uh, Ron, so what Ron and I are doing is watching kind of the last nine minutes of games that are close. Uh, Minnesota, it's actually Minnesota and Brooklyn are super interesting because they both lure you in to believe that they're going to be okay, and then they have a real stinker, and then you think they're not going to be okay. So Minnesota's stinker was yesterday. They just got waxed um, by the Warriors, who are great, but they were down 23 in the first quarter. That's a little much. Um, though it does look to me like uh, Rudy Gobert and D'Angelo Russell are figuring each other out. Um, they're beginning to play the pick and roll. They're beginning to play much better. Cats shooting the ball terribly right now, which is kind of disrupting everything they're doing. Some interesting substitution stuff by Minnesota in one of these close games. I think it might have been Charlotte and maybe one other. I think we watched them twice in which they were substituting in and out Cat and Gobert and not playing them together as much and doing a lot of substitutions late in those games to try to get them, I think I watched maybe their win over Indiana and then also their loss to Charlotte, 110-108. Um, rotating Gobert and Cat late and then having them both on the floor when they have to be. Uh, in the loss to Charlotte, there was a big alley-oop to Rudy. He says he should have made the play, but he has a sprained ankle and he couldn't get up to get it um, on a nice pass by Russell. We'll see. Minnesota's just a little funky. They are showing signs of being all right, and then they kind of do what they just did, which is lose to Charlotte and get blown out, and they're 10-10. and 10. Um, and we're 20 games in, so these things are pretty real at this point. Uh, the Blazers, Jeremy Grant is just bona fide. This is a heck of a story. He is a, you know, wing defending fringe player, gets offered a contract in, in Denver and in um, Detroit and says, I want to go to Detroit and prove that I'm a go-to guy in the NBA. And he actually does. And then he goes, now he's in, in Portland and is proving he's a go-to guy in the NBA. Last night they get blown out by... Uh, Brooklyn, but he has a pretty good game with 27 without Dame. The two nights before in the double overtime game against the Knicks, he goes to the free throw line 28 times. Like that game late was just Jeremy Grant prancing to the line every single time. He ended with 44 in that game. Jalen Brunson is in control for the Knicks. He did miss some shots late in that game. Um, they're playing quickly in Quentin Grimes again. I'm not sure either of them are any good, but they both have relevance to us, and R.J. Barrett continues to be wildly inconsistent. Um, quick note on the Pacers. I've watched them twice recently. Benedict Matherin is real. Um, I'm a little confused on Tyrese Halliburton. I am just not as in as the rest of the world on Tyrese Halliburton. I know the other night against Brooklyn, he had 21, 16, 5, 15. His shot just looks funky to me. I don't know. I might be wrong. I am sure I'm wrong, but, um, it's interesting. They, they, the Indiana plays very similar to us. They play really fast with the ball. They move it. They take a ton of threes. Carlisle's fully in on the numbers. On the threes, they're very, very similar to us in the way that they're playing right now. Halliburton is kind of at the helm on that one. The, watch the Bulls in a few close ones. They lost to Oklahoma City. This was a really interesting game for two reasons. One, um, and the Bulls are in tonight. They're just distinctly average at everything. They're 8-11, and 11 and every single one of their numbers is average. Uh, it is the DeMar DeRozan show. Like They're going DeMar DeRozan, middle of the free throw line. It's impossible to double him. Uh, the one time someone did double him, he kicked out for an open three to Kobe White. There's a ton of doubling. This is my number one takeaway for you. Um, I was going to end with this, but everyone's trying to double, and it just fails almost every time. The, the shooting in the league right now is too good to double. That's my takeaway is late. People are doubling. Get the ball out of DeRozan's hands. Get the ball out of Doncic's hands. Get the ball out of the guys in Bede's hands. 
Um, there, you know, a lot of action right at the nail in the middle of the floor, and you bring that double, and the Bulls will run DeRozan tonight over slightly to the right side. And so the only place you can double from is strong side corner, it, it, which is a death move. And they just then flip it over to Kobe White in the corner. It's a simple, basic, easy read, and someone hits that shot. Um, they're not a great three-point shooting team, but that's what you're playing with. Teams just have the floor space with good shooters so well that when you double, it's... Now, Toronto doubled Doncic. I'll get to this in game here in a second. Trouble, uh, Toronto doubled Doncic, and that's interesting because Dallas is 0-5 when Luka doesn't score 30, which is crazy. It's only happened five times, but... Dallas is moving the ball beautifully, so and Doncic makes the right play every single time, and it gets to a wide open three every time. You double Luka, you're giving up a wide open three. You have to decide you're willing to give up a wide open three. When you double DeRozan, you're giving up a wide open three to a guy in the right corner. You have to decide you're actually willing to do that. DeRozan's not been so efficient that his his, his mid range game is is not so great right now. They lost to Oklahoma City the night he was twelve of twenty seven, uh, twenty six of those were twos. Like, that's not great. The interesting one to me about Oklahoma City, they've played a ton of close games recently. They've been bouncing Josh Giddy in and out of the lineup late in games. Like, sometimes he closes, sometimes Isaiah Joe closes, sometimes Terrence Mann closes. Then in this Chicago, and I'm a little lukewarm on Josh Giddy because he really just can't shoot at all. I mean, it's, a, it's pretty much a disaster every time he shoots. It doesn't look good, and it's not close. And teams aren't guarding him. And then in this Chicago overtime win, 123-119, Josh Giddy completely dominated late in the game completely dominated, like drove to the baskets, got on top of the rack, hit out to guys. He had 10 points, 13 rebounds, nine assists. He was great. I mean, like great, great. Like right when I had said to Ron Boone, like I'm out on Josh Giddy um, and really worried about Josh Giddy. He scores back-to-back layups. It's 114, 114. He drives and scores, throws and scores. Giddy answers um, on the next possession. Then Giddy kicks out to someone for a draw and a kick and a foul. He was really great. I mean, like hit Kalen Williams, Caden Williams on a layup. Great, like absolutely game-playing, outstanding, big-time star uh, late in that game uh, for the Thunder. So he's an interesting one. Lonnie Walker's playing great uh, recently for the Lakers. He carried them in that game. I'm all in on Kyle Kuzma as a number one or two star on a team without Bradley Beal. I just want to let everyone know that. He's not the most efficient player in the world, but I am all in on Kyle Kuzma. I think he is the player I've watched the most this year who I think is ready if removed from playing under a star to make a jump. Rockets' Jalen Green is uh, is taking a, taking a big step, and the Hawks are kind of a mess. Worth keeping an eye on the Hawks right now. I think I always feel like when teams aren't closing games well as a group, they're on the verge of hitting a, a skid, and they are not. So keep an eye on that. That's how I felt on Cleveland. Cleveland's bounced back out of their skid. They got lucky. Um, we'll see whether they can start to figure out how to close games or not. Um, but keep an eye on that one because I do think there's a little something funky going on there in the way their inability to close games that should, may be problematic to them. Um, the Mavericks have lost four in a row. They're 9-10. and ten. And I'm not sure what's going on there. I'm not too worried. They lost. I mean, they lost to Toronto in a really close game, which the ball could have gone one way or the other. I mean, that's just a ball bounce game. I mean, and then they play back-to-back against the Milwaukee, who might be the best team in the league, and they lose that game. So that's two of them. I'm not sure I'm going to go worry about it, but it's worth keeping a little eye on. All right, that wraps up Locked on Jazz today. Thanks very much for tuning in. A little extended uh, edition for you. Hope you hope you don't mind the extra four or five minutes. Uh, postcast coming to you. Ron Boone and I will be on the floor at 445 at D-Lock 09, or right around there. Um, Jazz Bulls tonight. We'll see if we can get back on the winning track. Uh, DeRozan's mid-range game. The Bulls are just distinctly average at everything. I thought I printed it out, but don't seem to have. Um, and uh, we'll see whether Jazz... The Bulls don't... The Bulls run... To these two points that we talked about, here's your notes for tonight. The Bulls are the 19th ranked offensive rebounding team and the 18th ranked team in transition. So they're both below, av- slightly below average in those two. Good test to see whether we can fix either of those two issues. Talk to you soon.